I want to say it was like early 2000s when this research was first out and really investigated the five areas of the world where people have the longest lifespan and health span. So it's not even just longest life, but longest life without disease. Welcome to Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, talking wellness and weight loss for real life. We're here to clear up the myths, misinformation, bad science, and marketing to teach you how to eat and how to cheat. Are you ready? I'm having salad with a side of fries. Hey, friend. Welcome back to Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your health coach and host, Jen Trepic, here with you every week for Wellness Without the Weirdness. And I have a new friend for you today. Alan is here with me. Alan, welcome to Salad with a Side of Fries. Thanks, Jen. Nice to see you not in person. Uh, I know. Because I see you in person all the time. Exactly. So for anybody listening, if you have seen my YouTube, then you have seen Alan's work. So Alan is the brains behind Flavors of New York and Flavors of America. So we met and started filming at restaurants. And now you're here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what took you so long or what took me so long or I don't know, but I'm here. So anyway, (laughs) right, exactly Great to be here. Perfect. And I'm thrilled that you're here for this one, actually, because you have your own story of, you know, walking during the pandemic and a whole transformation in your life from walking. And I think that's going to fit into our topic for today. Okay. so today we're talking about blue zones. Have you heard of these? I know. All about them because you told me about them before you started the podcast. Right. (laughs) Perfect. So I want to say it was like early 2000s when this research was first out. The God, I can't. His name is escaping me. I'll put it in the episode notes for everybody. But he worked for National Geographic and really investigated the five areas of the world where people have the longest lifespan and health span. So it's not even just longest life, but longest life without disease. So he did all this research, wrote this book, and then recently there's been a resurgence of the conversation. And a bunch of other people in interviews on other people's podcasts, they were asking me about it. So I figured we should talk about it here too. And there's a piece of all of this that I think is one of the most overlooked elements of longevity. And fits perfectly into May as Mental Health Awareness Month. So we're going to get into all of that. Super quick, though, I want to tell our members what they're getting this week. So members, your recipe this week is for Rainbow Farrow Salad with Tahini Apple Dressing. And now I mentioned May is National Salad Month also the other week. So this is another salad for you. I love farro. It's an ancient grain. It's super nutty and delicious and satisfying. This whole recipe is a plant-based salad that doesn't rely on lettuce. So for everybody who is sick of lettuce, I got you. (laughs) And you could certainly add other things to it too and change it up based on whatever you have in your fridge. Oh, and the dressing, the tahini apple dressing, you're going to love. So if you want this recipe, be sure you're a member. Go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. For $10 a month, you get weekly recipes, a monthly article or tool, extra discounts from me and our partners, plus access to live Q&A sessions. It's a total deal because when you take advantage of the full offerings, you're going to save far more than that $10 cost. It's seriously a no-brainer way to show yourself that your health is a priority. Plus, being a member supports this podcast and this community so we can continue to bring you new episodes and experts every week. So remember, all you have to do is go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries, or just click the link in the episode notes because that's a lot easier than remembering the whole thing. Once you're there, you click support now, follow the prompts to enter your email and payment info, click subscribe, and you're all set. You'll get this week's recipe for the rainbow farro salad. This week's recipe for the rainbow farro salad with tahini apple dressing. Okay, so Alan, blue zones. There are five of them. You want to know where they are? Do I get to phone a friend? Oh, you're the friend. Right. <laughs> I got you. So it's Sardinia, Italy, the islands of Okinawa, Japan, the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Ikaria, Greece, 
I'm probably saying that long. Maybe it's Ikaria, whatever, Greece, and Loma Linda, California. So these are the areas that people are living past 100 years old. They also have the lowest rates of chronic disease. So even with these people who are, you know, at 100 and beyond, they have the highest cognitive function, the sharpest memory, right? And far exceeding the physical vitality of what we see elsewhere. So knowing that we don't necessarily, you know, that you don't necessarily know, Alan, not to put you on the spot, just from living in this world, what do you think are the biggest factors in longevity? Well, aside from geographical elements to it, I would say a healthy lifestyle that includes eating right, exercise, avoiding toxins, which could come from the environment. Sure. You know, not having a 16 ton weight uh, fall on top of your head from various sources or, or uh, Skylab or airplane parts. <laughs> uh, so um, now looking at the areas that you mentioned, they all seem to be, you know, pretty warm climates, probably or temperate to warm. But I was like, what ties them together? Is it like culture? Is it lifestyle? Is it like, do, do they all exactly. do yogurt? Is it the water? Yeah, it's yes to a lot of these. So we're going to talk through, I think you're exactly right. We're going to talk through the nutrition piece. We're going to talk through the movement piece. And then you're right. We're going to talk about the culture stuff. And that's where we're going to get into some of these things that I think are highly overlooked. But one of the things that people will say is, oh, it must be genetics. You know, the genetics and certainly genetics plays a factor. But in the book, he says the genetics is really only about 20 to 25 percent of how long we live and that everything else, right, the other 75, 80 percent is about our lifestyle, right? How we're living every day. And then to your point too, on the toxins front, right? And so there's a piece of also understanding how our environment plays a part in that. You know, we did an episode about using your environment to change behavior. And that's a big piece of this. They have set up their lives. They've set up their communities to foster health. And so as we go through some of these commonalities, we'll start with the food, but I think it's also worth considering, like, how could you, in your corner of the world, start to tweak things to maybe make it look more like some of these blue zones? Because they're doing that, right? That's sort of been like the next phase of his work is almost creating blue zones, working with some local governments and nonprofits to create, you know, some health and longevity in other places. So let's start with the commonalities when it comes to food. So to your point, these are sort of seem to be more like moderate climates. I know for years, the Mediterranean diet was a thing because everybody thought this was all about the Mediterranean diet. And then recently there were headlines about the Atlantic diet. We did a nutrition nugget on the Atlantic diet. And the truth is, the key thing is that they are eating local foods seasonal foods that are from the earth, right? Essentially, they're not eating processed food. Another interesting piece is that they stop eating when they're 80% full, which is not easy for many of us to do, <laughs> right? They do drink red wine in moderation. It was interesting. They did these dietary surveys, in these communities, and they looked at them over time. So they looked at what some of these centenarians were eating when they were in their 20s and what they're eating when they're, you know, 100 or 100 plus. And essentially, they're eating greens, right? Local seasonal vegetables, tubers, which are like sweet potatoes, whole grains, not processed refined grains, but truly whole grains, nuts, and beans. So according to his research, a cup of beans per day is worth about four years of extra life expectancy. And these populations are eating animal protein more on occasion. So they're eating maybe like 20 pounds a year of animal protein. 
in the US, we eat more like 220 pounds of animal protein a year. <laughs> so their animal protein tends to be more for like a special occasion, a celebration, those kinds of things. And it kind of reminds me of like the hunter gatherer life of like there may not be animal protein every day. Alan, what's sticking with you from what I've shared so far? Well, when you first brought up the subject, I thought of a commercial that used to run in the 70s for Dan and Yogurt, where they showed really old people that lived in uh, Soviet Georgia. And they were, uh, you know, well, it has to be yogurt, right? But, you know, that climate was probably one where they had no choice but to eat foods from the land, you know, whether it was grown or livestock. And, you know, and we all know that most of the food that's generally available, especially in urban areas, is full of preservatives and toxins and, you know, that there are ways that we bring food to market in this country that other countries wouldn't, don't allow. So if the people in Loma Linda, you know, it's the only area in the United States, right? The only blue zone in the United States? Yes. So there must be, you know, more land centric commune type health nuts with a highly evolved sensibility towards what they put in their body than 99.999% of all Americans. And then you mentioned some areas, you know, Caribbean and Mediterranean. Yeah. And the Caribbean, you know, Caribbeans, people in the Caribbean eat a lot of beans. And, and if, you know, in their areas that are remote, they're going to eat a lot of uh, things from the land and so on and so forth. So it all makes sense. Yeah. But when you first mentioned it, I'm like, you know, I wonder if they all have great well water, you know, because the areas are so really different. I don't know much about Okinawa, Japan, other than from the Karate Kid. Um, (laughs) Well, here's what's interesting about all this. And going back to what you were saying about, you know, the way most Americans eat. So technically, Okinawa is no longer a blue zone because as we see Western food, and chains making their way into other parts of the world, they're seeing life expectancy and health span change. So essentially, the way Americans eat, it's like stepping on the gas, pressing down the accelerator pedal of aging and disease. And so it's also a function. I I say that just to highlight that this isn't permanent. It's not like, oh, we do these things, check the box and we're done. It's a continued commitment to these choices in this lifestyle. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sure one of the components of all these people is that it's become so habit forming that it's, you know, it is just is. It's not like they're making a choice or that they feel like they're sacrificing. And I'm sure that they have things that we don't consider to be shall we say, a treat or special that they like on a regular basis that, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I find when I used to go on diets, I don't go on diets anymore, that when I had the time where I, where I went off my diet, that the happiness that I felt was very brief, came with remorse, and then physically made me ill. So they don't have that. Right. You know, they're committed to something that they both enjoy and know that's good for them. And it's just part of their routine. Exactly. I think more than anything, it's like, this is just how it is. Yeah. You know, like to your point of culture, they've created the culture where this is just what they do and how they live. Right. You know, and then when it gets disrupted with our Western innovation, (laughs) right? right? Innovation in air quotes, you know, we disrupt their health. So interesting on the 80% full thing, you know, and maybe what often, like you were saying, you know, can lead to some of people here feeling shame or guilt or, you know, whatever. A couple of things that help on the 80% full thing. They pre-plate their food. They sit around the table. They slow down their lives to eat a meal. And they slow down the meal. You know, there's conversation happening. It's not wolf it down while we're staring at a computer screen or the television to go on to the next thing, you know, and remember that old thing of like, you know, it takes time for the stomach to signal the brain, you know, and for the brain to register that the stomach is full. 
So they, by slowing down the meal, that happens. They're giving that time for the stomach and the brain to communicate. So when you say pre-plate the meal, you mean that the food has portions on the plate and the plates are brought uh, brought to the the table. table with already the portions on them. So whatever the meal exists of, that's what you have to eat. And you want to make it last through the term of the meal, you know, whatever conversation, so on and so forth, because you're not like, oh, there's more. There's a giant bowl of seconds on the table. I'm just going to finish my plate. And because I'm bored, I'm going to, you know, put a couple more spoonfuls of mac and cheese on there. Um, Exactly. So that's a cultural thing. And that's, you know, I mean, it, it comes from whoever the person who's most responsible for providing the meal in the household sets the tone and how they present the meal as opposed to being a free-for-all. And it's a formal thing. They probably don't have people with uh, mobile devices at the table, which I think is a big problem here. I know it's a problem for me because my mobile device is always at the table. Yeah. Guilty as charged, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of that. and But I think it's interesting, you know, you were saying it's on the person plating the food, you know, the person responsible for the meal. I look at it a little bit differently. I look at it as kind of nudges from the environment, right? That it's the fact that the portions on the plate is a nudge from our environment. Like, you know, the fact that we're sitting around and having this communal meal it's like a nudge from the environment to make some of these more healthful choices, you know? So it goes back to how can we create the scenario so that this stuff is easier to do? Does that make sense? So what do you mean nudges from the environment? Explain. That it's little things in our environment that we can set up to make the healthful choices the easiest choice. So to your point of not having the big bowl of pasta on the table, right, is a little nudge from the environment, from the table setting to eat what's on our plate. By sitting at the table together, it's a nudge from the environment to slow down, right? That even if I finish what's on my plate, I'm not necessarily getting up and running because we're engaged in conversation. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because there used to be meals used to be a ritual, especially, yes. you know, you and I had a similar upbringing, especially around holiday time. The right. holiday was everyone was at the table and then there were courses, especially, you know, around holidays like Passover. I was going to make a Passover joke about Pharaoh salad. I was like, is Pharaoh <laughs> salad kosher for Passover? Because that's, you know, Pharaoh. Anyway. Totally. Right. <laughs> um, so in those instances, you know, each course had a time frame. So everyone right. was eating the same course at the same time. And if you ended up eating your course too fast, then you were going to have to wait for everybody else anyway. Right. So exactly. The ritual could determine, you know, and I think generally you were introducing the idea of a single plate meal, but it could be multiple small plates. And of course, there are cultures where the whole meal is a succession of small plates. Yes. Like, like omakase. Right. You know? Right. And, but your whole point about a ritual is spot on. And we're going to come back to that because I want to spend more time talking about that. So let's do the activity piece and then I want to come back. So talking about movement in the blue zones, they move naturally right? They don't necessarily put extra effort into thinking about it. It's just the activity is part of their lives. So these tend to be walkable neighborhoods, right? So it's actually in some of the ongoing research, people, right, living in a walkable neighborhood where there are playgrounds, the activity level of that community is 20% higher than the neighborhoods that aren't as walkable and don't have those playgrounds. 24% of people and I believe this is in the United States, get the minimum recommended amount of activity, which is only 20 minutes, right? (laughs) So it really speaks to how our lifestyle of going to the gym is almost like the antithesis of human nature, 
And really what's happening in these blue zones is human movement, right? Natural, regular movement in the course of their daily lives. And you, Mr. Allen, took up walking. Yeah. Do you want me to tell the story of my walking? Sure. Sure. So up until around 2017-ish, I always had a, a major problem with my weight. I you know, was pushing 280, 290 at one point. I think then I was about 265. And my father passed away in October of 2016. And my mom was living in Florida. We relocated her to Connecticut, which is where my family is. And you know, she only had a short time left because she had the uh, heart disease. The uh, I can't remember the term for it, but she, she only had like anyway. a year and a half. Yeah. So, you know, I spent a lot of time with her where I hadn't spent that much time with her. And, you know, and she had always been concerned about my weight, my sister's weight, because I, I have an older sister who's much heavier than I was. And I decided that while I still had her, I was going to try to lose weight. And I just started walking. And the other thing about the walking was I got my first smartphone. It was an iPhone 6, and it had a pedometer app. So I was like, wow, it's measuring my steps. And as I had this thing, I was it was like a contest. So I started walking, and when she passed away in March of 2018, I went, you know, I'd gone from like 265 to 213. And then I just continued walking. I got down to about 180. Now I'm like up to about 200 even. And I made the whole, you know, app and thing. And, you know, two weeks before the pandemic, I was on a streak of 10,000 steps a day. And I kept that streak going until March 20th of this year, which, you know, as you know, I walked 25 miles that day. Then I took three days off from my my goal of 10,000, and then I'm back to it. I've walked every day since then. So for four years and, and one month, I just made getting 10,000 steps every single day, rain or shine, snow, cold. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if I was tired. It didn't matter if I was sick. I mean, I walked during COVID. So just because I could, because I could control that. And I don't go to the gym. I can't stand going to the gym. Like you said, you know, having, you know, a day where you can get activity organically to say, well, I'm now going to go exert myself. I mean, and some people thrive on it and I don't knock anybody and I should be doing some sort of weight resistance or whatever. And I don't. It's just not my cup of tea. And the other thing about walking is I'm an early bird. I was raised on a farm. So I go out walking at 515 in the morning, you know, and I get 7000 steps, you know, by 645. And it gives me a lot of time to think about the day ahead and the week ahead and it clears my mind. And, you know, I sip coffee during that walk and uh, I have some of my favorite areas, you know, uh, down by the water, East Chester Bay. So it's a routine. So just saying that that's important for me and that I like it and that it's accessible, I think are all ingredients in the fact that it has has worked for me. And I don't look at it as a chore. And, you know, every day I just look up my steps. And, you know, today I think I am on 13,000 steps. And some days I go, you know, over 20, but some days I only go 10,000 and change. So it's just, it is, it just is. Yeah. And that's the thing about movement in life. And to your point of the accessibility of walking, you know, I often make the joke of, you know, I don't care if you're circling your couch, you know, like it doesn't even have to be outside. It just steps. You know, you can go back to our episode with Jordan Syatt, the single best exercise you can do. And that was walking. Right. And that's what we see in these blue zones. Right. And then the interesting thing, too, in some of the research and what they've done since then of working with municipalities to help implement some of these health factors. I think it was Singapore where they basically disincentivized the luxuries. So they made gas incredibly expensive, which pushed everybody. And they made vehicles incredibly expensive in order to nudge people to take public transit and walk. 
And so because of that, they have a ton of money going into the transit system, which makes it more functional and more people use it. And so it's all these little things. The more just activity in terms of going about the course of our daily lives, the better. And that's going to make a tremendous difference in our longevity. Yeah. And you know, the tragedy of that situation is in New York City and other cities, somehow someone decided that electric scooters were a good idea. <laughs> so, so, you know, don't take a 20 minute walk when you can get there in five minutes on an electric scooter. And by the way, you might smash your head open on the sidewalk or you might hit some old lady and you're not supposed to ride on the sidewalk. So if you ride on the sidewalk, it's illegal and dangerous for pedestrians. If you ride in the street like you're supposed to, it's dangerous for you. And meanwhile, these scooters, these rent scooters are strewn all over the place. You know, I see them in the park, yeah. in the woods. And to me, it's the dumbest thing on. And no matter how you look at it, it's dumb. But there you go. Yeah, I think this was years ago. I was in Atlanta. And there were just random scooters laying across the sidewalk. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> they're random, but, they're yeah. random in my neighborhood. They're right. all over the place. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen people get hit and I've seen close calls and these people are whipping up and down. And I'm like, how much time are you really saving by riding this scooter? And they have signs posted in the park where I walk that you can't have a scooter. I'm like, none of this makes any sense. You know, and at the end of the day, someone's making money from these scooters. And we're a society built on an opportunity to make money. And that is obscene in and of itself. Well, so that's the point of what they're doing in these communities is disincentivizing, right? Making those things so expensive, right? So the processed food is more expensive than the locally grown string beans. Yeah. And here it's the exact opposite. Exactly. Exactly. But that's what they're creating. So it's not necessarily that that was the nature of some of these places initially. I'm not talking about blue zones, but in the stuff where now they're trying to improve the longevity, take lessons from the blue zones and implement it in other cities. This is a major piece of that is shifting the economics to encourage the behavior that's healthful and health supporting rather than, you know, the convenience. There's another book not related to blue zones. There's another book that I was just hearing an interview with the author that I want to say it's something like catastrophic convenience or something like that, you know, that it's all these conveniences that are really diminishing our health. The other commonalities that I want to go through are the ones that tie into Mental Health Awareness Month, Mental Health Action Day, which is May 16th. So if you're, that's tomorrow, if you're listening the day this goes live, and so I want to spend the rest of the time talking about all of that stuff. And I also think these are the parts of the blue zones that people gloss over. So we're going to dedicate a little more effort to that. Really quick, let's thank our partner for this episode. Big thanks to Lumiere DeV Skincare. Lumiere DeV Skincare was founded by Amber Ridinger McLaughlin in response to her own experience of mere marginal results from countless costly creams. She realized the revitalization of her youthful skin could only occur if she developed products herself. Working closely with beauty scientists and exploring the most advanced ingredients derived from the earth and sea, Amber created Lumiere de Vie, the next generation of skincare. The extensive line of luxury skincare products is designed to address all skin types and concerns. With the highest quality natural ingredients and powerful formulas that help heal, soothe, moisturize, and protect, Lumiere de Vie acts as first aid for your skin. The result is rejuvenated, luminous, beautiful looking skin. So in honor of having Alan with us and in the interest of self-care and mental health, let's highlight a couple of the Lumiere de Vie Ohm products. So this is their men's line. So the skincare value kit gives you the cleanser, toner pads, and the hydrating aloe cream for $75.50. The toner pads themselves, by the way, are awesome. They're just $38 on their own. I love them. Like, you know those moments when you just don't feel like washing your face? I use the toner pads. There's also the Tiger's Eye Roller or the Ice Roller for $17.50 each, which are great little gifts to say thinking of you or maybe for Father's Day. We passed Mother's Day, but <laughs> Father's Day is coming up. So because you're a salad with a side of fries listener, you get 10% off plus free shipping. So what a deal. 
right? Text the word skin, S-K-I-N, to 844-947-4846. You'll receive the link and coupon code right to your phone. Again, simply text the word skin to 844-947-4846 to try Lumiere de V Skin Care at 10% off and free shipping. This is a toll-free number. Standard text and data rates may apply. Okay, so we've talked about this culture thing, right? I think here's some of the commonalities. They are generally optimists and don't carry as much stress. They participate in a spiritual community. They make family a priority, intentionally surround themselves with like-minded friends, and have a definitive and clear purpose for their life. So sharing meals is one of the ways that they experience community. And by having these friends and the family as a priority. So in a lot of these places, the grandparents are very much an active part of taking care of the family and taking care of the young kids. So that gives them purpose. It gives them added responsibility, right? And it really is a major difference in terms of how I think a lot of people think of the elderly. Like here, we're sort of like put them in a home and put them all together. You know, we think that there, like sometimes there are friend groups, you know, in these homes. But what if keeping everybody together actually helped everyone? I don't know. Now I'm rambling. What's coming to you, Alan? When I was younger, there was a trope that said that to live a long life, a man who was a farmer that had four kids or more would live a long life. And you can Google that. I think there was one or two other criteria. But my father met all those criteria and my father lived to 103. So if you don't have the benefit of, you know, adapting to the culture of one of these geographic areas, there are certainly things that can exist. And, you know, I think the genetics were good in my family. And the other thing was that my parents were Holocaust survivors. So there is also something about if you go through starvation at a certain point of your life, it does something to your immune system. So mm -hmm. I think there are things that one can certainly do for themselves if, you know, not everyone's goal is to live to be 100. I mean, especially right. if you're around a lot of other people who are living to be 100 and they bore you. Well, but, but I think that's the difference, though, between lifespan and health span. Yeah. Right. I think we have this idea that if somebody lives to be 100, they're 100 and decrepit versus like, what if. You know, I think even now, what we used to think of as, you know, somebody in their 50s is really what we see now of somebody in their 80s or 90s. You know, like we're already sort of pushing that. But I think improving health span where those years might look exactly the same as 20 or 30 years earlier. I don't know. I think yeah. people might. My parents were big walkers also and bowlers, actually. And they did. Yeah, they were very social. They always had a group of friends. They outlived most of their friends, but they were always very social. So, you know, whether you're in a commune in, you know, Sunrise, Florida or a commune in Loma Linda or, or Sardinia right. or whatever else, these traits, these commonalities, you know, don't have to, I guess, be limited to the they just happen to be more prevalent in those areas. Right. And I think the culture of our many of our lives today, not in those areas, don't foster the same right. community. You know, like, for example, I was out walking with a friend the other day, actually, Christine, who's joined me on this podcast before. So some of you guys might remember her. She and I were out walking, we're talking, and she was telling the story of watching these dancers. And so her arms got really big and she was sort of, you know, like sort of imitating these dancers and she accidentally hit a woman. And I watched it all happen. That woman, like her first reaction was like anger and judgment and frustration. You know what I mean? And Christine's reaction was like, she pulled her hands in and almost like was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, and then the woman said, you're talking about dance. You're my people. I get it. And it's like community. That's community, right? right? We can create dialogue and have conversation. And I watched both of them sort of have that first reaction and then soften. You know, it's such a difference. 
I think in, for so many people, especially right now, it's community has turned into a judgment of others yeah. rather than really bringing together, bringing people together and learning and growing and having dialogue. Right. Community is, has become adversarial where you've got one community pitted against another community in battle. And I, and I think, you know, to what you and I have been working on for so many years and and telling these stories of people is that we just want to have people invest the time in a wanting to tell their story and b wanting to hear stories as opposed to, you know, 15 second sound bites on social media is that, you know, if, if someone's speaking about their life and someone's listening and learning something that they didn't know, and they make that a habit, you know, reading, mm -hmm. you know, reading should be a habit of many people are, are not avid readers because they don't want to know any more than they already know. They think they know everything. And none of us knows as much as we should know, as, as much as we want to know. You know, we have multiple other reasons for filming these videos. But at, at the end of the day, bringing people together, you know, and nothing is more common than the consumption of food because everyone has right. to eat. So. Right. Community over food, sharing that meal, you know, telling stories, having those conversations while baking breaking bread not well maybe baking bread too but certainly breaking bread interesting also what we see in the blue zones and in these communities with longer health span is that they laugh together and they cry together right that there's emotion in these communities like in sardinia in particular they really poke fun at each other you know and they have this healthy social life and so it's interesting so at least three friends that you can laugh with and who care about you on a bad day is worth about eight years of life expectancy. Now, in the 80s, Americans had about three friends. Today, we're down to about two friends who meet that criteria. You know, and again, because of the way our lives are now and the way our communities are, we don't necessarily strike up conversation with a stranger, right? Everybody's on their phone standing in line somewhere or on the subway. And we don't as often as our grandparents have those like serendipitous run-ins with someone we know. You know, when it does happen, we're reminded of how small this world is, but it doesn't happen as often as, you know, it did decades ago. So I think it's other things for us to consider in terms of community and connection. Are you familiar with Simon Sinek? Yes. Okay. So for those of you who aren't, so Simon Sinek, I think the thing that made him like most, I was going to say famous, but I don't know that he's really famous, but he did the TED talk of his book is start with why his TED talk was like the why, how, what, you know, start with why is his thing. And so he talks about connection and he uses Apple as an example of like, when we start with why we make things, then we're more apt to buy all these other things from Apple, even if it's not, you know, the what that we're used to them making. Anyway, he's on a kick right now talking about this thing about eight minutes. So he's saying what it actually takes is eight minutes in connection with somebody to turn things around for us, whether we need to vent, whether we need to laugh or cry or just sit in silence and be in connection, whatever it is. So he was saying that one of the things that he started with his friends or that his friend group started is because it's not always easy to ask someone for support or to say, hey, I need you right now, right? And a lot of times we don't want to impose and all those other things. So he was saying that he and his friends started this thing where they will text and say, do you have eight minutes? Which is their way of saying, I need eight minutes, right? I need a little bit of time. I need some support or whatever is going on. But it's an easier way of asking that question. And then when the person responds and you end up on the phone, there's an expectation that this isn't going to be six seconds, <laughs> you know, and we're going to spend eight minutes. And I think there's something about that that just really has stuck in my mind. I don't know. How does that sit with you? I mean, I, I get it. I, I have my own little story. So, you know, I graduated from high school 40 something years ago, but I was very friendly. There was a there was a about a dozen of us that were very close. 
And about nine of those people remain on a text thread that we keep and that we constantly communicate. And we try to get together at least once a year, sometimes twice. You know, we've had get togethers at, you know, lakefront property owned by one of our classmates a couple times during the last four years. And somehow that connection has survived more than most relationships that I've had with people since then. And most of my relationships now, uh, you know, outside of my relationship with my girlfriend are really about business. They're related to my career. There is no, and there isn't really isn't any room for a social relationship for me. It's just, yeah, it's not part of the ingredient, you know? So, but having that, I guess if I were to say, you know, who I needed eight minutes with, it would probably be one of these nine people from high school. Yeah, for sure. But also to your point of so many of our adult relationships revolve around work or I see it a lot, you know, revolve around kids activities, right? Where they're not necessarily deep connection, right? but they're the people that we end up seeing most often. And I think it's also our modern world where we have such a connection to our work. And then post-retirement, we lose purpose. And that is a major risk factor for deteriorating health. Yeah. I don't see myself retiring for any reason that I can identify, despite the fact that financially I'm not in a position to retire. but. Just from the fact that I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I I didn't have something to do. Exactly. And that is purpose, right? This is a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And this is, I think, the thing that nobody talks about or talks about enough when it comes to the blue zones and when it comes to what I think our modern American lives are really missing. You know, we don't even have like the language around it. So in Okinawa, they have a word called ikigai, right? Which is purpose. The Nikoyans have, they call it plan de vida, right? It's, they have a language around this, which gives it a level of importance that we really don't have. And it shows up in the research. NIH funded a study over 11 years. They followed highly functioning people between the ages of 65 and 92 and found that individuals who expressed a clear goal in life, something to get up for in the morning, something that made a difference, lived longer and were sharper than those who did not. And in other longitudinal studies, so studies over time, subjects without a sense of ikigai or purpose have a significant association with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, among others. So fundamentally, It's really about a reason to get up in the morning. So then it goes to, it reminded me of the fact that these families in a lot of these blue zones, the grandparents are still living with the families. And they actually call it the grandmother effect. I mean, it could be, you know, not just, it could be any grandparent, but they call it the grandmother effect because children living with grandparents, you know, grandparents living with them show lower rates of disease and mortality, even in the kids who are surrounded by that community. And I think that gives some of these older people so much purpose, right? If they're there helping take care of the kids, that might be a huge reason to get out of bed in the morning. Sure. I ended up in a whole rabbit hole of Seinfeld interviews. So Seinfeld is huge about purpose. Like he talks about it as, you know, finding his thing and that like the only thing that matters is getting better at what you're doing, right? So he has this whole thing. He's, you know, chasing growth. He's chasing getting better and learning. And I feel like for a lot of Americans, we think that's in our work, But in fact, only 30% of Americans have purpose in their work. We are generally out of alignment between our values, our purpose, and our work. And so if we can move toward alignment and have a reason for getting out of bed in the morning, it's truly transformative in terms of health. Yeah, I'm fortunate that I look forward to those things that I've committed myself to do professionally. 
and the challenge, you know, therein and creatively and logistically. And so I get that. And I think yeah, my father was similar. Now, I don't think he liked what he was doing, but I, he liked why he was doing it. So, you know, the farm, right. it was not a romantic. He found purpose. He found purpose, especially after, you know, finding that he beat the odds and even surviving the Holocaust and then having a family and having a life partner like my mother. So, uh, and yeah. he, you know, he had his little hobbies. He was putting together, you know, furniture and little clocks and things that he used to make. So he was always creating things. He was very creative. And I, I guess I get my creativity from him, although I don't have his skill. <laughs> That's okay. I think a great little exercise or practice to do for everybody is kind of grab a piece of paper and just write down all the activities that you do in your day. You know, the little things like washing your face or, you know, even the bigger things, right? Maybe it is your work or whatever. Write down the list of the things that you do in a day and then go through and just highlight the ones that bring you into alignment with your purpose. No judgment, <laughs> right? But just see how that plays out. And then see what happens if you can start to build some things into your day where there's at least something every day that's an activity aligned with your purpose. All right, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Alan, final thought? Well, this was fun. This was new. And I appreciate the invitation. And uh, now I can uh, add one more life experience to mine. And uh, I will be seeing you in person in the very near yes. future. And uh, you'll hear my real thoughts. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Right. Well, I think for this topic, the takeaway is while these blue zones have a lot to teach us, I think it's also really heartening that there's nothing there that the rest of us also couldn't do. Exactly. Well said. And <laughs> there's sort of like the blue zones 1.0 and the blue zones 2.0. Because, like I mentioned, Okinawa is no longer a blue zone and Singapore is becoming one. So I think the other takeaway is we have to keep doing the things. You know, we have to make sure that we're creating the environment to continue these things rather than just, you know, thinking we can check the box and let it go. So, all right, let me preview our nutrition nugget. So on Friday, we're talking about neural nostalgia. So maybe you've seen the videos on social media where people are like rocking out to hits from 30, 40 years ago. And I'm curious, think about that song that when it comes on, it changes everything for you. Like you can't help but be in a better mood and move your body and sing along. And I'm willing to bet that it's a song from when you were a teenager. And it's no coincidence, it's because of neural nostalgia. So this is also perfect for Mental Health Action Day and Mental Health Awareness Month. So we're going to get into it on Friday in this week's Nutrition Nugget. So be sure, click follow or the plus sign in the app where you're listening, and then your app will remind you when the Nutrition Nugget is live on Friday morning. As always, everybody, I'm your host, Jen Trepic. Connect with me on Instagram or all social media. I am at Jen Trepic, J-E-N-N-T-R-E-P-E-C-K. Website is a salad with a side of fries.com. Pick your platform, send a message. I want to hear from you, your takeaways, your ideas, your questions. This is also the easiest way to learn more about working with me as your health coach. Ellen, thank you again for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And of course, everybody, if you are not already, join our membership by going to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. This shows your support for this podcast, this community, but most importantly, it supports your health. You'll get this week's recipe for the rainbow farro salad with tahini apple dressing. So until next week, remember, as much as we focus on nutrition, movement, sleep, our health, our longevity is also served by focusing on community and a sense of purpose in life. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. Congratulations for making yourself and your health a priority. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to click subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast platform, share us with a friend, and we'll be back next week. 
Always remember, you deserve it and you are worth it. Happy healthy.